Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Gaunter. Today, Chartwork CEO Ross Clark takes a look at how the major markets did over the past week. Wall Street window editor Mike Swanson gives us an overview about how he believes the markets will perform over the near future. He also comments on cryptocurrencies and how he never really bought into them. Ed Steer from Ed Steer Gold and Silver examines how the precious metals are doing and how silver really should be performing if the precious metals market wasn't so manipulated. Plus, a reminder at the end of the show, we'll have company showcase updates from American Manganese President Larry Ray and Cypress Development Corporate Consultant Don Mosher. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. I'm Brian Fowler, President of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlant District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Chartwork CEO Ross Clark. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Well, it was a nice two-week break and uh, get back and find that most items are pretty much where they were when I left. Um, a few changes, but uh, pretty much uh, common across the board. I guess go look for the items that have moved. Um, we've got interest rates now, uh, the 10-year yield on the U.S., which had, you know, a big move in the last year and a half, went from, uh, what, 135 uh, all the way up to almost 3%, and then backed off a little bit, and now we're up at 2.95%. Uh, so that's the highest in four years on the U.S. 10-year uh, Treasury yields. It's definitely gaining some upside momentum because the last pullback here in this last uh, four or five weeks was only gave back about a quarter of the rise that it had since the fall. So we're starting to see acceleration there on the upside, and it shouldn't be too much longer before it's pushing through 3%. The equity markets, it seems like we have one strong day up and then a weekday down. Is it going to be bumpy from now on? Uh, well, it's clearly it's still stuck inside this trading range. We're going from short-term overbots and oversolds, and I would say these moves are more like uh, three days to a week, um, sort of a maximum run either way. Um, the February low, and in particular, probably more the more recent low here of the last two weeks, I think are the the critical support levels to be keeping an eye on there. But uh, it's it's really a day by day affair, and I think for uh, for investors, um, you know, unless you're selling premium or you're a day trader, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd just sit back from there right now. The uh, Looking at, uh, say, one item that has had a pretty good run, and it's up against significant resistance right now, has been the silver market. You know, we talked over the last month about the, the very uh, big speculative short position that was out there, and... Uh, the, uh, in the last two weeks, we've had a, a nice rally in silver. It's up to resistance. It's also uh, up to what I see as a, a sequential count, uh, and I won't get into the background on it. It's up to a Bollinger Band resistance, and the money flow indices like the demand index are up against key resistance levels right now. We also have had the tightest Bollinger Band in the last 40 years, so this market is ready to break outside of this trading range. Somewhere around 1735 would be on the upside, 1585 on the lower side. Um, this market's probably ready for a pretty good run, whether it's more short covering. And uh, there might be a bit of that still left. I see that the COT numbers for this week now show that the speculative short position had dropped uh, from being 15,000 short to just actually under 100 now. So we've seen a bit of a clean out with the shorts. 
And uh, we've also seen the relative strength of the silver to gold ratio get up over 70. So that puts it overbought right now. President Trump is complaining about the Chinese manipulating their currency. Does he have a legitimate complaint? I got a real kick out of that when I heard his uh, tweet uh, earlier this week. I mean, here we are. If you go back to the U.S. inauguration, uh, the dollar index is down 12% against the basket of currencies in that time frame. The, it's, it's down 16% against the euro, uh, 16 against the pound, 7% against the yen, and even 55 to 6% against the Canadian dollar. And the Chinese yuan, which is the one he's really complaining about, U.S. dollar's down 8% against that. So, you know, when it comes to politicians, I really question what comes out of their mouths. Ross, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. we we'll be back with you next week. My guest has been Ross Clark, CEO of Chartworks. Coming up, Mike Swanson, editor of Wall Street Window, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE, symbol CRL, and the pink, symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. I'm Bill McWilliam, president of Cascadero Copper, CCD on the TSX Venture Exchange. Cesium is one of the world's rarest metals with a growing industrial demand. Drilling is underway on our Tehran property in Argentina to prove up a cesium resource. Cascadero's patent-pending leach process has the potential to make Cascadero the lowest-cost supplier of cesium in the world. Visit our website, cascadero.com, or phone us at 604-924-5504. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Alva Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Oh, it's great to talk with you. It's, it's been an interesting two weeks since we last spoke. Well, we had missiles fly in Syria over an alleged gas attack on children. Has that really affected the precious metals market? Well, it's actually quite interesting to see what has happened with the metals market um, because last year there was uh, also a strike against Syria that Trump did uh, around April uh, exactly <laughs> and gold was above it touched about 1300 a year ago in April and then it corrected and went down to 1220 so it basically fell close to eighty dollars um, and it was in a trading range for much of last year, really with 1200 uh, the bottom. Uh, so it, it sold off pretty substantially last year uh, following news like that. And interestingly enough, in August, uh, there were all these threats about you know North Korea and Trump too, and gold didn't really respond and go up during that time either. So I actually find the action right now to be quite encouraging uh, for gold bulls, which I'm um, one of them, uh, because we had the Syria missile strike over the weekend, and gold um, hasn't fallen at all. And in fact, the mining stocks um, are up since those strikes took place. Uh, for instance, Newmont is at $42. Uh, the last time we spoke, it was around $38. And many of the big cap mining stocks are actually doing quite well uh, Freeport McNamara, um, hit a 52 week high today. Um, Rio Tinto, uh, hit a 52 week high today. Uh, the Buena, uh, the BVN is the symbol of Buena Ventura. Uh, 
uh, which is a Brazilian gold miner, it did the same thing. Now, GDX isn't doing as well as these leading mining stocks because it's been way down by Barrick, which has uh, been down this year. It's, it's, it's been one one of the weaker stocks really in the entire stock market, and 8% of GDX is in Barrick. So that's kind of weighed it down, and I know so many people now to only focus on the ETFs, and they think gold stocks are languishing because GDX uh, isn't up, at, you know, like these other stocks are. But gold is up year-to-date 3.2%. Um, Newmont is up over 14%. DVN is up over 14%. Uh, Mac, Freeport McNamara, Rio Tinto up much more. Uh, Royal Gold's doing very well. Uh, the Silver Miner is doing really well. And these are performances that are trouncing the stock market. The S&P 500 is only up 1.1% year to date. Um, bonds are down. Uh, the TLT 20 year bond ETF is down almost 5% year to date. Uh, Facebook which was a stock that we were supposed to own all the time. It seemed to be invincible. It's actually down too, almost 5% for the year. Uh, there are individual stocks, of course, that are really on a tear. Netflix is the top gaining stock down the S&P 500. It's up over 75%. That stock alone is really almost uh, helping to push the market averages in the green, at least the S&P 500 this year. Uh, QQQs, the NASDAQ 100 would probably be green without it, but if Netflix was down, I don't know if the S&P 500 would even be up. Half the stocks in the S&P 500 are actually red for the year, in fact. Intel, though, is up 16%, uh, so it's, you know, helping. So that's, in, in the broad market, it's really, uh, you know, about 20 high-tech caps, high-tech, uh, big-cap stocks that are still doing well, and only 10 of them are up over 20%. And, I'm saying all these things to just try to drive home the point that, look, the stock market is sluggish this year. Uh, it's had its ups and downs, but gold is outperforming the S&P 500. Gold is green, and bonds are red. Um, and I said that last week when we last spoke that gold is really, I think, going to be the bright spot as time goes on for people to want to get more and more involved in. We're not really at the point yet where people feel like that. Um, people aren't really noticing these things I'm talking about. And, and in the end, gold is still below 1360. It's encouraging that it has not sold off the news like it did last year and so many times before, but it still really needs to get above 1360 to bring true excitement, to get people to want to, to get robots really to buy on a breakout and the masses to, to want to chase too. And 1360 has been resistance now. Uh, since about 2013, we're speaking really five years. Uh, so it's such a key psychological level. I think we'll see it broken this year, but I have no way to predict the time uh, ahead of time that that's going to happen. So I'm personally just content to hold gold investment positions and, you know, know that they're doing well. You know, the right gold mining stocks are doing well this year, and, and that's good enough for me. <laughs> Well, so many people are wondering, you know, is this the low in the nine-year gold cycle, so it's due to go up, or do we need a new dip to make it the nine-year low and then it goes up? But still, a lot of people are, are saying we're in that territory. Well, I, I, I think the low is in 2016, uh, if they're speaking of an ultimate low like that. And frankly, I mean, I, I think it's going to break out this year. Uh, if gold was going to, you know, break down, go below even 1200, I think the mining stocks would really be very weak. And, and it wouldn't just be barrack weak, but Newmont, the GDX would be at new lows. It'd be a total disaster. But even more encouraging than gold is, uh, well, first I also need to add that we would also be seeing a very large commercial short position in gold. And that really isn't the case at all. In fact, over the past month, the commercials have reduced their short positions overall, uh, and it, well, with gold being at these near resistance levels, and they would be doing the opposite, betting against gold, I think, if we were going to 
have to make new lows before the real bull market's coming, I, or the next bull run's coming, I should say. And so I, I, I think that people, you know, are, are being overly negative. The other thing I got to add, though, is silver is even more bullish than gold when it comes to the commitment of traders report because they've got the lowest net short position in gold and in silver uh, that they've had in about 30 years. They're almost net long silver. Um, and silver, you know, <laughs> is trading in an extremely narrow range. If it clears uh, 17 and a half is the resistance long term, and we're at um, 1680 about as, as I'm speaking, and there's minor resistance, really 17, but 17 and a half is the key level. Um, but the commercials are, are almost net long. I mean, it's the most bullish report in 30 years. So I don't see any reason to be pessimistic. I mean, frankly, I think the real reason people are pessimistic and I understand it is because these things have been trading in, in below resistance for years. And it's not so much that people are losing money because of that, but they're not making lots of money. Um, and it's, it causes people to become impatient and give up. And in the end, it's, it's rising prices. Uh, that brings excitement. Uh, we saw that with Bitcoin in December when it skyrocketed. Everyone talked about it. And this week, uh, it was Netflix that fascinated uh, the financial people on television on Tuesday because it went up almost 9%. But it went up 9% after having gone up almost 75% since the beginning of the year. It's really the wonder stock, much like Facebook had been at times in the video, it's it's these situations that uh, we see something going up and it almost needs to never end. That's what gets people bullish, and that's why we really need to see gold break 1360 for these people who are looking for this cycle low, you know, nine years or whatever, to come out and say, well, we got to invalidate that. We're breaking out, and, and I've just got to be bullish and buy. And it's it's price action in the end that dictates people's opinions, everyone's opinions, and and uh, I. You know, try not to focus too much on the short-term action uh, because it can get you so confused uh, in all markets and situations. We're speaking with Mike Swanson. Mike, Russia has decided to restrict uranium shipments. Is that going to start really boosting the price of uranium? Well, it's interesting because finally uh, <laughs> there's been a pop in uranium stocks on this news. Uh, the There's a global uranium ETF, and it was at $12.00. A month ago, and today as we're speaking, it's at 14. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not really an expert on the uranium mining industry, so I don't know how much supply the nuclear power plants need and how much the Russian announcement is going to affect things. But looking at the charts, um, you know, I'm not really sure. I mean, we're seeing uranium went from 12 to 14. The URE, URA ETF. Well, from 12 to 14, but it's still in a range uh, with the high at $16. So we're still way off the high of January. And, and I think, you know, we've had a good pop and it needs to digest this news and probably take a month or two to do that before I will know, have a better opinion on this. If, if we can go sideways here for two months, let's say, uh, digest the move to 14, then break out again, I'd be much more positive and and, and frankly, even excited about it. But right now, we just had a sharp move, move in reaction to this news, and I kind of want to see what's going to happen because I don't like to just chase the news myself. Uh, that that can make it though, so I can miss out at times. But I'm just willing to be patient and and see what happens. And I never feel like I've got to be in one situation because if I miss it, there'll be some other situation. And I tend to be looking at many markets and developments all at, uh, all at one time. Uh, so I don't have to feel like I miss out on something. Something will line up somewhere else. What's happening with crude? It stayed strong over the winter, which was unusual. Is it going to keep uh, increasing in strength? Well, it, crude's an interesting uh, market because um, <laughs> if you look at the XLE ETF, which is the energy ETF, it's quite remarkable the way well, it's acted because in uh, January, when the Dow fell, it was among 
the oil stocks were among the worst performing sectors in the entire market on that drop in the Dow when the Dow fell about 10%. What's funny, though, is in the past week, uh, these things have shot straight up. Uh, XLE was at 66, as we're speaking, it's at 74. The price of oil has gone uh, from a low of 58 at the bottom of February to touching 68 uh, just a couple days ago. So, you know, we're seeing some good movement there, and I'm not really sure with that either. Uh, and one reason is that the commercials have a massive net short position with oil, and that makes me uncomfortable to, 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 uh, to dive into it. But the action is definitely positive, and I want to see really what happens over the summer uh, with this move that we've just seen lately. Uh, I don't think, you know, the oil's... I doubt oil stocks are going to continue to move up like this without first pausing and digesting this move, much like I'm speaking of the uranium stock. So I want to see them do that, and, and maybe they'll, for me, be with a good entry point uh, in a couple months. But if I own these things, you know, I wouldn't be selling them. I'd be happy with the move. We'll have more with Wall Street Window editor Mike Swanson next on This Week in Money. Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold, including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. Mike, the New York Attorney General, is investigating cryptocurrencies. Other jurisdictions have put warnings out about certain cryptocurrencies. Is this a space people have to be really careful with right now? I definitely think so. And and today, in fact, uh, CNBC did a news report saying that Riot Blockchain is also under a formal SEC investigation. Uh, That's a stock that last year, or a year ago, um, last April, was a biotech company. And in the fall, they rebranded themselves as a blockchain Bitcoin play. I may have actually spoken of the stock, making note of this, in in, uh, September, October. I know I did on the Internet, but regardless... It went from about seven and a half when I first noticed it uh, to over forty dollars uh, in December, and now it's under SEC investigation below seven. Total disaster, um, and that's another one. Uh, LFIN got delisted, and yeah, the SEC is also speaking of cracking down on crypto exchanges, and it's a big, a big problem with people that play Bitcoin and their other cryptocurrencies when some of these exchanges have vanished or they've said we don't have the money or we've been hacked or this or that. It does seem to me that people are stealing the money, but a lot of the Bitcoin stocks are now under fire from SEC, from the SEC. So, uh, yeah, it, it's a space, you know, I, I really don't want anything to do with myself. Just from a risk to reward standpoint, you know, I think it topped out in December and it was a big bubble and it's just, you know, pretty much a dead market evidence of this is that the number of daily bitcoin transactions 
uh, has collapsed. It's where it was uh, since over a year ago. There was a mania in the fall, and that mania is completely gone. It appeared, you know, that when they started the futures trading for for a little bit, that, oh, this could be the next new thing. Everyone's going to want to trade it, uh, and this and that. And really, people are barely trading it any more than they were uh, before all that happened. In fact, they're trading it less. So I think it's a dying market, uh, a bear market, really. And people, you know, the people involved in it, are they classify themselves as hodlers, just holding on, dreaming that it's going to go up one day, you know, who knows when, if ever, and, and then other people trying to trade it by guessing the bottom. But I'm more interested in markets that I can believe in, that are transparent. Um, I buy stocks that, you know, the, of companies that have to file with the SEC, they have to issue quarterly reports and and so forth with ICOs and coins. That's really not the case at the moment. Hopefully it will be, but the problem with that is if the regulators force more transparency, no one's going to want to invest in these things because they're just basically, you know, hot air. So that's going to kill it off too. Well, I know when we originally started talking about it, I asked, is this the modern day equivalent of the tulip craze that rocked Europe back in, I think, the 16, 1700s? And, uh, you were one of the few people who said, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I thought that, but at the same time, in, in the October, November period, I, I was talking about buying some of these stocks. I talked about buying the riot stock. I, I actually bought, I didn't, personally buy that one but i did buy a couple others and i lost a little bit of money in it myself so that's the kind of funny thing even though you know i was downing the overall investment thesis i still got caught up in the bubble a little bit myself you know it wasn't i didn't put much money in it but i still put some in it so that's what happens though when you when you look at the markets every single day and you see things move and and, and so i criticize people for chasing things, but look, I did it myself uh, with a small amount of money, but I did do it. Um, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, well, it's the old take a flyer on it and see what happens. Well, that was exactly my attitude. I, I did this, uh, I, I think, after Thanksgiving, and I thought, well, this is really going to go up like they say. I'll just put, you know, a little bit of money in it, and, and that will turn into something. Um, you know, if it's going to really turn into like the internet mania in 1999 and continue. But it didn't, and, uh, and and I do think you know it is like the internet mania because yeah, eBay's here, Amazon's here, uh, and all these you know companies that did start out, but most of those internet stocks don't even exist anymore. That red hot in uh, in the late nineties, and and that's really even if this Bitcoin has got validity to it and is real, it's going to just be a couple of these currencies that last and already. Uh, I looked the other week, and there's like 1,500 of them, and and only but 100 are even really trading at all. So it's already starting to happen where they're just dying out one by one slowly. Well, I mean, it got to the point anybody who knew anything about blockchain technology and, and bought a couple of video uh, servers would have the computing power to, to make their own cryptocurrency and see how many people would just throw their money at it. Yeah, and, and they were. I mean, it, <laughs> people were throwing their money at it. The craziest story I heard, and I don't, I don't know if I told you this one or not, because it was so crazy. I didn't ever heard anything like this. But this was in December when Bitcoin was peaking out. And I've got a friend of mine who works, um, he's a police officer, but he works in the jail. And he told me that there were people that they were arresting, you know, for drunk in public or drunk driving or, you know, just, misdemeanor type things that would go into the jails they'd have to they'd take their phones from them they would beg the the officers to let them keep their phones because they'd have bitcoin trades on i mean and it had never heard anything like that that's how pervasive though the mania really was i mean it, it, i mean I, I on my facebook where i live there's people that never talk about the stock market or and, and then they were talking about Bitcoin and it, but what was so magical about Bitcoin was that it it was set up in such a way that anybody could trade it and you didn't even you didn't need to open up a brokerage account you didn't even really need to have any money you could put in twenty bucks and and play Bitcoin I mean typically you need at least five hundred dollars to open up a stock account and really you need a couple thousand to make it viable but Bitcoin you could 
borrow money on a credit card and do it. So that's what a lot of people are doing. I mean, what I mean, borrow twenty bucks or something. Not like you got to go in big debt. And and there is the promise that you know Bitcoin was going to go to a million or something. So if you put in twenty dollars, theoretically, that could turn into something. So I think a lot of people just got sucked into it as if it was a lottery ticket. And frankly, you know, when I said I bought a couple of Bitcoin stocks and lost money on them, that's essentially what I was doing myself too. So um, everyone kind of got sucked into this thing, but that's the lesson of financial markets is when everyone gets bullish and excited and there's a true mania and something, watch out. Now, with the stock market, uh, people who are bullish on the market have told me over the years that there'll never be a top in the bull market until there's a mania, uh, like there was in 1999. And there's no mania yet, they would they say, so the market's not topping out. And I think the big lesson of Bitcoin is that was the mania. Bitcoin was the trading mania, just like Internet stocks were in the 90s. It was Bitcoin. And what was what's interesting is that we had a U.S. stock market mania in the 90s that culminated in Internet mania. And it was really U.S.-centric, a U.S.-based mania. This time, what we've seen is a global mania in stock markets around the world, almost every single one of them going up uh, since 2011 or so um, without ever pulling back uh, up until really this January. And that global mania in financial markets needed something that everyone around the world could trade together to become the final um, <laughs> manic sector thing to play like the Internet stocks were. And I think that's what cryptocurrency actually represents, a speculative blow-off that happened that was a pure trading mania all over the world of masses of people. And this is the event that so many bulls have been saying needs to happen in the markets to be able to say, you know, we're near a top or something. And it happened. Um, and that was um, three signs I was looking for to spell the end of the stock market bull market in the United States was one of them, Bitcoin topping out, which happened. Number two is a bear market in the bond market. And I think that's actually starting uh, because TLT is under the 200-day moving average, a J, which is the government treasury bond, uh, J&K went below the 200-day moving average, that's the junk bond ETF, has bounced back above it over the past week, but that bounce looks to be fading. It looks to me like it's making an epic top um, and is going to go into a bear market. I actually I'm, I'm, think it's in one, but regardless, it's not declining rapidly. There's a corporate bond ETF, um, LQD, uh, which is one of the largest ones. It's way below the 200-day moving average. And if, so I think the bond market sign that I'm looking for is, is happening. The third and final thing is internal weakness in the stock market. And I think we're starting to see that, but that's something that can take several more months to, to actually play out. So I think there are big warning signs that, to me, that are, are, are appearing this year for the stock market. Price has to confirm that uh and right now uh we're, we're we've hit the 200 day moving average twice this year on the s&p 500 we're essentially now bouncing off of it this month and if we go below it again for more than a week stay below it and i think we're going to be in a confirmed bear market so i see this as a year of transition and that's why we're seeing i believe the increased stock market volatility and also i think could be the reason why gold is outperforming. I mean, uh, the S&P, as I mentioned, is up like a percent. Gold is up by three and a half percent or so, 3.3 percent as, as, as far as uh, yesterday. Um, and I think that's the reason why. The U.S. dollar also is in a bear market below the 200-day moving averages. And that's how I define a bear market is something below the 200-day moving average with that moving average acting as resistance. Uh, so this is a very interesting year i mean i say these things that i'm not saying the stock market's going to crash next week in 2007 the stock market essentially had a correction at march and didn't really tip over into a complete bear market until uh november as the year came to a close so the bottom line is that i just feel like I, I, this is a year i got to really be on top of things 
because when you're in a year of transition into a bear market, it's a huge turning point where you see new leadership that starts new bull markets. I think that's what's happening with gold. Um, and, and you just have to shift money and take advantage of things uh, because it's not so much about selling to prevent losing money or being scared. It's simply that when the stock market makes the transition, there's new things that break away from the, the negative stock market movements and just go up, uh, and that's where you want to be invested. So um, in 2007, that in that August, gold and gold stocks, uh, soared that month and outperformed for a year. Uh, Treasury bonds did the same. The U.S. dollar did the same. This year, uh, it's different. Uh, Treasury bonds are being bear market. So it's so far, it's only gold that's really breaking away. And some tech stocks like Netflix that people are, you know, they're still doing well, that people are still chasing and excited about. But in the year 2000, when the Internet bubble busted, it was utility stocks, tobacco stocks that... Uh, went above their 200-day moving averages after having been in bear markets for years, and they outperformed for almost 20 years. Uh, stocks like Philip Morris have been in horrible bear markets up until March of 2000. REITs did the same thing, and gold actually came, uh, ended a bear market that year too, although it didn't completely take off um, until about 2002. It based really for two years, uh, much like it's done for two years, for almost two years now. Uh, so uh, these are, you know, I think exciting times. I know the stock market moves up and down a lot every single day. Get, that's what gets our attention. But behind the scenes, I think there's lots of stuff happening. And, you know, you start out talking about the Syria news. and The reaction to gold on that is very uh, in- indicative, I think, because when you see a market such as gold not just sell news, that's a positive. When you see something sell news, whether it's good or bad, that's when you know you're in a bear market. And uh, in the past, gold would do that. It's not really doing that now. And I think, you know, hopefully that's a sign of more things to come for it. Mike, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's great talk with you as always. My guest has been Mike Swanson, editor of WallStreetWindow.com. Coming up, Ed Steer, founder of EdSteerGoldAndSilver.com, next on This Week in Money. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol, PBX. For more information, please visit us at PowerVanSolutions.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. Paddock Ventures Corp. is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Paddock's management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Paddock will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Paddock trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, paddockventures.com. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. 
I'm speaking with Ed Steer. He's the founder of EdSteerGoldAndSilver.com and a director of GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. He's speaking to us from Edmonton. Ed, welcome back to This Week in Money. Uh, always glad to be on your show, Jim. Ed, what are the breakout levels for gold and silver? Well, you know, I'll tell you what. I looked at that question when you sent it to me, and uh, basically the breakout levels are whatever the uh, commercial traders decide they're going to be. When you look at a gold chart or a silver chart or platinum or palladium or any of the precious metals, those prices are set in the COMEX futures market by the commercial uh, traders betting against what are called the managed money traders, and they can set the prices for whatever they want. So to tell you that a break right now, if you look at the gold chart, breakout is, what, 1360 an ounce? Uh, that's as high as they've allowed it to get in 2018. So uh, looking at the chart, you say, well, the breakout point is 1360, but the fact of the matter is that it could be at any price that they decide to let it go, and especially that applies to silver with what happened on on uh, on Wednesday. So if they want it to go, all they have to do is back off shorting the uh, precious metals, and the precious metals will rocket. So as far as the breakout levels, they're whatever the commercial traders determine them to be. How are the commitment of trader numbers looking for gold and silver? Well, uh, we get a COT report today, and that's as of the Tuesday uh, COMEX close. And um, I was talking to Ted, and his estimation was we're going to see a slight increase in the commercial net short positions in both gold and silver. Uh, but if you're talking about what's happened since the cutoff, like what happened on Wednesday and what happened again yesterday, uh, we've probably seen a massive deterioration and a wildly bullish structure that we had in silver has uh, not entirely gone away, but a large portion of it has disappeared. So things aren't quite as bullish as um, they appear, no matter what's in the uh, commitment of traders report. And like I said in my column this morning, this COT report, when we get it this afternoon, is basically going to be yesterday's news. Could silver see a short squeeze? Well, that, that's what everybody's expecting, and uh, the possibility was was there in spades. Uh, the managed money traders were maximum short, and the commercials were maximum long. And all they had to do was put their hands in their pockets and let the next rally go without going in there and selling all the long positions to these these short holders, because uh, the short holders would have to buy them buy their positions back. They could have let the price run up one, two, three, four, five, ten dollars before they decided to part with their uh, long positions and allow them to cover. But they didn't. They just run it up about what was forty eight or fifty cents or whatever the heck it was, and then they capped the price. And uh, so that's where we sit today. But the possibility of a short squeeze is always there. But it always, like I said, depends on the commercial traders. And as Ted Butler says, ultimately it depends on what J.P. Morgan does. Is there a looming silver shortage? Uh, I would say at the moment, right this particular moment, I'd say there is not. I would say the market is probably very tight because J.P. Morgan is siphoning up all the, J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs is, are siphoning up all the physical silver they can get their hands on. But I can tell you right now that the moment, the moment that we see prices blow up, uh, one or two or five or ten dollars or whatever, I can guarantee you that the retail demand for silver will go through the roof and, uh, you'll see, uh, inventories evaporate and, uh, a silver shortage will be on us in no time flat. Is one of the reasons silver is used in all of these, uh, solar power projects? It's an industrial metal as well as a precious metal? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. Industrial demand is a huge portion of, of you know, silver usage. Uh, the the, uh, the variable factor is the retail it, retail demand. Uh, sooner or later, of course, commercial use is going to catch up, and it's going to take all of uh, the uh, silver production out there. Uh, but right now, on the margins, it's investment demand that will determine determine whether there's a shortage or not. Is there any major exploration for new silver mines? Well, uh, at this price, there certainly isn't. I know that most major silver companies out there right now are doing as little as they have to uh, to keep their reserves up. And if they are increasing their reserves, they're doing it by uh, purchasing uh, small exploration companies that already have proven reserves in the ground. So right now, and according to uh, the latest uh, surveys from the Silver Institute and Goldfield Mineral Services, is that uh, there's... The fall off in exploration has been uh, pretty dramatic in 2017, and that's the same can be said for gold. Sales of silver coins and bars dropped off last year. Is that a sign silver being out of favor and a bottoming process taking place? Well, uh, I can 
can tell you right now, I used, I used to work part-time in the retail bullion business, and the, the uh, gold and silver bar sales have been down for a lot longer than that since about 2014. So it's been three or four years since there's been any kind of retail demand whatsoever. And, uh, of course, the only thing that's going to get retail demand uh, back up again is rising prices. And uh, until uh, prices rise uh, substantially or uh, by a decent amount, the retail demand is gone. All you have to do is look at the uh, U.S. mint sales for 2018, and they're down, what, almost 85%, 90% from what they were, say, eight or nine years ago when things were at their peak. So when uh, price goes up, retail demand will uh, certainly pick up almost at once. Yeah, I'm not seeing any more of those uh, Canadian mint ads for Bugs Bunny silver coins and so on. No, it's been very quiet out there. All the mints are suffering, uh, especially the uh, U.S. mint and the Canadian mint. In 2011, did the silver market run precede the gold market run, and is that normal? Well, the reason it, it uh, preceded is because... Um, investment demand was absolutely driving the price at that time uh, nobody was in there shorting the market uh, and uh, the silver market was doing what it was supposed to do there was no physical supply to be had so what was happening is that uh, people who wanted silver had to go into the comex futures market to buy it and they were driving up the price so for a very brief period of time before jp morgan stepped in on may the first 2011 we had a basically a free market in silver but as you know what happened we had that drive by shooting on that day and the next morning we woke up we woke up monday morning with a silver price down six dollars so uh that was a true supply demand situation and what happened in gold was entirely different from that that happened later mm-hmm do you think that money that normally would have gone into the gold silver market was siphoned off by the cryptocurrency craze last year? Uh, there's, there's no question about it. It certainly had effect. I, w- I would think that not only did it siphon off money, I think prob- people probably either sold their gold and silver equities or physical metal itself just so they could go rushing into the newest, uh, uh, a fad on the block, which was the cryptocurrency. Some people who got in early did, early did very well, and some people, uh, as you know, got their heads handed to them. But there's no question about it. It had it had an effect, but by that time, retail sales uh, of silver and gold bullion were already in the tank, so uh, the effect was, wasn't as great as it, as it should have been. Well, so many people warned with the way it was spiking that the, the cryptocurrency mania seemed a whole lot like the tulips of the Middle Ages. Well, tulips in the Middle Ages and uh, some of the other price runouts we've seen, I think when pe- people start talking about $100,000 Bitcoin, that was the time to sell. And I think that when we see silver and gold run the next time, we're going to see a spike in prices like that uh, that happened with, say, Bitcoin. And when you see a vertical spike like that, I can absolutely guarantee you that its uh, shelf life is very limited, and those are the kind of rallies you should be selling into. And I hope the people who have precious metals uh, and have, get the next bull market or smart enough to sell when that happens is the gold silver ratio bullish for silver uh well it's way out of whack it's it's what 80 to 1 a little over 80 to 1 whatever it is um it comes silver comes out of the ground at a ratio of nine ounces of silver to one ounce of gold so just based on production it should be far less than that even a reasonable ratio of say 30 to 1 or 20 to 1 would put silver at, you know 50 75 100 bucks right now which is uh which is closer to what it should be but there's no question about it. the gold silver ratio has been way out of whack for years and uh sooner or later that's going to return to normal and that will happen of course when silver is allowed to make its big move when the silver market runs how does the US dollar usually react well i'll tell you what the currencies are just as managed as everything else and if if J.P. Morgan and the commercial traders in the COMEX futures market decide that silver and gold are going to run to the upside, then it matters not what the currency markets are doing because uh, uh, once they decide that they're not going to go short, uh, precious metals are going to take off. I don't care whether the U.S. dollar index is going up, down, or sideways. The precious metals will react entirely differently as to what the dollar is doing. Canada and the U.K. sold off all their physical silver when prices were low. Uh, meanwhile, we have Russia and China still stockpiling gold. Who made the right move or is making the right move? Yeah, well, UK and, uh, Canada, well, Canada sold off their gold, uh, oh, well, that was 20 some years ago. And, uh, I think England sold off part of their gold to, um, 
to rescue the bullion banks when we had the Washington Agreement back in the early 2000s. And, uh, of course, Russia and China are buying the stuff. They know perfectly well that gold is money and that uh, the West has basically um, uh, corrupted itself by selling all its gold to protect its friends. And sooner or later, uh, the golden rule is going to kick in. The Russians know it. The Chinese know it. The Turkish people know it. Uh, who else? There's a long list of countries out there that are going to find out uh, and who know the golden rule that he who has the gold makes the rules. Are the junior gold and silver stocks turning bullish? Uh, well, I, I, you know, I own about 14 or 15 different uh, silver mining companies in my stock portfolio, and it's the smaller ones that uh, smaller to intermediate sized producers are doing doing the best. They're like is Endeavor and First Majestic and uh, Fortuna and companies like that are doing exceptionally well. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they're leading the market right now. And as I've said in my column for the last two or three months, there's a stealth accumulation of shares going on in, in the uh, in in the silver equities, and it's certainly showing up in the price. And the juniors are certainly benefiting from that. Is there a benefit for the gold or silver manipulators to move the prices higher? Well, that is the million-dollar question, isn't it? Um, J.P. Morgan, according to Ted Butler, is sitting on 700 million ounces worth of silver. We know they've got 140 million sitting in the COMEX for sure. And Ted Wells figures they got 20-plus million ounces of gold stash away too. So uh, it would be certainly financially beneficial for J.P. Morgan to see the prices move higher. For the rest of the COMEX traders who are on the short side, that would be uh, game over for them. But the fact that if we see precious metals moving higher and, and dramatically higher, it will be a signal to the rest of the world that there's something wrong with the financial system, uh, whether it be just the U.S. financial system or the whole world's financial system, and a run from from paper assets, which we have in the stock market, the bond market, etc., and like Bitcoin, would become with the run from from paper to physical assets would be uh, immediate and very would happen almost overnight because you can change your asset portfolios to the click of a mouse nowadays. And if, of all the things that are out there about my higher prices of precious metals, this is what the powers that be fear the most. Does the U.S. dollar look like it's in a new trading range? Well, if you check a, a, a Dixie chart, uh, you'll note that the first, uh, starting on the first trading day after January the 1st, 2017, the U.S. dollar has done nothing but go down. Uh, I think this is a conscious decision on behalf of, on, on part of the U.S. government to devalue their currency. And I think that the trading range we're sitting at right now, which is around, what, 90, uh, is just another stair step uh, to going lower. I think that the dollar index has got a long way to fall from here that will allow it to fall. Uh, 80s, uh, the next logical step from here, but I wouldn't be surprised that this year or next year we'll see it much lower than that because the American economy just can't compete at uh, the price of the U.S. dollar as it right now. Is the Canadian dollar likely to benefit from higher gold and silver prices? You would think so, and the reason for that is because that once silver and gold prices start to rise, uh, and the the boys take the, the their foot off of the precious metal prices, that will allow all commodity prices to rise. I don't know whether it's crude oil or rice or rubber or cocoa or tin or wheat or whatever. You're going to see all the countries that produce commodities, South America, Central America, Russia, China, Australia, New Zealand, and of course Canada along with it, and even the U.S., which is also a commodity producer. Uh, you would think it would, um, it would certainly help the... Um, the, the Canadian dollar, and it would also help the currencies of all the commodity-producing countries in the world. And that would be a good thing for everybody, and the sooner it happens, as far as I'm concerned, the better. Ed, what's happening with the Gold Antitrust Action Committee? Well, we're still getting the word out there. I, uh, Chris Powell, our secretary-treasurer, was in um, Hong Kong and Singapore uh, speaking at conferences uh, just uh, last month. And he just got back from there a week or so ago. And I know he was in London last fall, and I was speaking at the conference in Vancouver in January. So I know Bill Murphy was there as well. So we're out there getting the word out. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we've been doing this for almost 20 years now. And uh, everybody out there and his dog, including the miners, the investors, know that the prices of precious metals are managed. So we're kind of speaking to the choir, but we're going to keep buggering on, as Winston Churchill said, until this... Uh, Precious Metals Price Management Scheme, led by J.P. Morgan, that breathes its last. Ed, how can people find out more about your newsletter? Uh, just You can Google my name, Ed Steer, E-D-S-T-E-E-R, Ed Steer, Gold, Silver, and uh, that'll pop up, and you can click on the uh, 
on my website, and you can find a. I have a column there that uh, a sort of a column that you can use to to look at and see what my products all about. And if you like what you read in my sample column, then you're free to subscribe. And the, the freight is a hundred dollars U.S. per year. Ed, thanks for being on this week in money. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Ed Steer, founder of EdSteerGoldAndSilver.com. He's also a director of GATA. He was speaking to us from Edmonton. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Mike Swanson, and Ed Steer. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show, you can email us at info at HowStreet.com. Plus, a reminder, at the end of the show, we'll have company showcase updates with American Manganese President and CEO Larry Ray and Cypress Development Corporate Consultant Don Mosher. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. My guest is Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm talking to you from uh, down in uh, Nevada at uh, a uh, convention that's put on by Argus Specialty. We were asked to present here at the Hilton Lake Las Vegas Resort. and. Uh, just to elaborate on that, it's interesting that that resort is in Henderson, and Henderson's uh, basically where all that work took place back in the uh, in the war in the First World War, Second World War, by the U.S. Bureau of Mines on the manganese process that they were never able to successfully complete. And here we are presenting down there, and we've uh, we were successful in completing that. So I just thought that would be a little interest to our listeners. So, Larry, what did you have to uh, tell the convention, and uh, how does that affect your shareholders? Okay, there was a, uh, a very good uh, group of people. It must have been about uh, over 100. You have to remember this was a, <clears throat> a uh, convention where the entry fee at the gate was $1,600. So it's not... Uh, it's not for just uh, anybody coming off the street to kick some tires. This was a convention of, of people, uh, decision makers. <clears throat> and we had a lot of interest in our battery uh, uh, solution for lithium ion batteries. Uh, interest from automobile factories from down to or up to uh, representatives of some big labs that the DOE has in the uh, U.S., a lot of them I'd, been, I'd talked to on the phone before, but now <clears throat> we've met. And uh, the car, uh, car, automobile interest for the EV cars, again, is uh, out of Asia. And uh, they're very interested. So I think uh, there may be some ongoing uh, collaboration there. I'm uh, <clears throat> hoping that... Uh, we got some. We already shot back and forth a couple of ideas, but this is really premature. We can't say that we got anything cooking, but I am. Um, I'm very optimistic that uh, something's going to come out of it. And we also went down for a evening at the uh, recycling convention in Las Vegas, and uh, there were six thousand people there. So uh, I did meet some recyclers, and uh, everything's moving forward. I know that people are impatient. Uh, I try to keep them supplied in news, and uh, <clears throat> but news doesn't seem to help in the market at the moment. And uh, <clears throat> but when I get back, hopefully we'll have a good progress report on what's happening in the uh, chemical research lab. But I'm really excited about what's happening down here, Jim, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, you know we, we're well received. Very well received, and uh, but the reality is that uh, recycling is still a way behind rare earths when it comes down to attendance. 
because there was also a rare earth uh, sex segment to this Argus uh, Argus uh, convention. But we did, uh, we got a lot of attention. We had a booth there. And uh, so a lot of our literature was picked up. And a lot of people talked to us at that booth. So I'm optimistic and uh, I'm happy. I mean, it was well worth the money to come down here and do that. So next week, I hope to bring uh, some news out on a podcast that we're doing something, uh, what we're doing with uh, Kometco. And uh, I'll be flying back tomorrow, not tomorrow, on Friday. And uh, so that's. I just wanted to let everybody know that everything was uh, moving well and we were well received at the convention. And uh, we made some very good contacts. Larry, for new listeners, can you explain what American Manganese does and why you're so popular at these recycling conventions? Okay, the American Manganese is a critical metals company that's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that has uh, developed a, a process that is being patented by uh, a process that uh, was actually started in the area where we had the convention. And uh, so that's for uh, liberating the cathode materials from lithium-ion batteries and... Uh, the, uh, we're traded on, or we have a website at AmericanManganeseInc.com and we're traded on the, uh, uh, TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY. We're traded in the U.S. under the symbol um, AMYZF and we're traded in, uh, Frankfurt at, under the symbol 2M. <clears throat> you can reach me at 778-574-4444. Or send emails to L R E A U G H at A M Y M N dot com. Larry, thanks for the update. Thank you. My guest has been Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. We were speaking on April nineteenth. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Don Mosher. He's the corporate consultant for Cypress Development. Welcome back to the show, Don. Thank you very much, Jim. Always a pleasure. So far, so good for Cypress? Uh, yeah, it's it's been an exceptional project. And for a mining uh, project, it's moving at, uh, you know, light speeds, basically. I don't think I've ever seen anything move through exploration towards development as fast as this project. Where is this project, and what have you found so far? Uh, this project is in Clayton Valley, Nevada, which has the very first brine, lithium brine operation ever put into uh, production in, on a global basis. Uh, it's owned by Abermarley that bought it off of uh, Rockwell Holdings a couple of years ago. And so it's got a lot of history behind it. And we went in and looked at something different, which is a claystone deposit that appears to be an old lake bed. And it's uh, seven kilometers long. It's one and a half to two kilometers wide, and it sits right at surface. So I, this thing has size. It's got the right geometry. The jurisdiction doesn't get any better, whether you look at it from a U.S. federal policy standpoint with Trump wanting to see more strategic metals or whether you're looking at a mining friendly state like Nevada or even potential end users like Tesla which has a domestic mandate on buying production uh, but there is virtually no U.S. lithium production to speak of at all. There's a little bit out of Abermarley Silver Peaks uh, facility in Clayton Valley but it, it's very very small. Why do you think uh, people should be so optimistic about it? Because it's very accessible in a very friendly market? Yeah, I mean, there's good lithium demand, and, uh, you know, there's been 
a variety on views, whether you look at what Morgan Stanley put out talking about the potential for oversupply or you take a look at what uh, Canaccord put out last week where they're, where they're reviewing what projected production was going to be going back to 2012 and what actually came online. It's just a fraction of what's what was projected coming online because it, it's taken a much longer to put a lot of these Solars into production. Um, getting the financing and moving the hard rock deposits forward. So the numbers are not there as to what they expected going back five, six years ago. Don, where is Cyprus traded and how can people find out more information about it? Cyprus trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange. Uh, they can go to our website, and, which is uh, Cyprus Development. Corp.com, and all our corporate presentations are on there and all the news releases and financials and a bit of background on our management and board. Um, pretty much everything you need is there. Don, thanks a lot for the update. Always a pleasure, Jim. My guest has been Don Mosher, corporate consultant to Cypress Development. We were speaking on April 20th. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.